inside. Oh yes, the light is dawning. Well, I never knew that. And the mountain apparently is Mount Iger. So amazing. Look, let's look at the next one. Cisco. Now, Cisco is a huge data transmission and management company. They actually get their name from San Francisco. And the straight lines of varying length above their name are there to tell you something. They're there to tell you that they're based in San Francisco. And if you look at the outline of the straight lines, it's a representation of the Golden Gate Bridge, which is in San Francisco. There you go. Let's have a look at another one. FedEx. Now, you've all seen the FedEx vans zipping around the locality and up and down the motorways, I'm sure. And you may even have had parcels delivered by FedEx. But have you ever seen, if you look at the E and the X, FedEx, have you seen the arrow between the E and the X? FedEx. Oh, yes. The light is dawning. It's there to tell you that FedEx is a company that's always moving forward, delivering parcels, as they. But it's a company that's progressive. That's the message it's meant to convey. Amazon. Everybody's seen Amazon. They advertise on the TV. You will have had parcels delivered by Amazon, I'm sure. And you can see the smile underneath. Amazon, can't you? But it's actually an arrow, and you'll see that the arrow starts under the A, and it finishes under the Z. And that is meant to tell you that they've got everything in stock from A to Z. And I'm not here to advertise Amazon. Hidden messages, you see. La Tour de France, you all have seen in recent weeks the Tour de France, finished a few weeks ago in Paris. But if you look at the blob, the round orange blob on the right hand side, you'll see a matchstick man crouching over what is the front wheel of a bike. The back wheel is the circle in the middle with a dot in the middle of it. So there you go, it's Le Tour de France, but there's a cyclist in the middle of the logo. Now you can't really see this one. If you were close to, it's actually, thank you John, it's a cup. And if you ever buy sandwiches from Subway, and you have a coffee from Subway, you'll see the two opposing arrows, right? One underneath the other. But can you see the S in between? Very clever, isn't it? S, advertising subway. Now, finally, a few weeks ago, I had cause to hire a car. And all was well with this car until I needed to put some fuel into it. So, I pulled onto the pet petrol station which side of the pumps do I go? Hmm. So I made a choice. Pumps in front of me. I went on the right-hand side of the pumps. Jumped out of the car. Wrong choice. The petrol filler cap was on the offside, not on the near side. So I had to get in and manoeuvre it round the other side of the pump. However, they make it so simple for you these days. If you look at the petrol pump in the middle of the picture, you'll see a tiny little arrowhead on the left of the petrol pump. And ladies and gentlemen, that's there to tell you which side of the car the petrol filler cap is on. So next time you're driving a car that you're not familiar with and you need to fill it up with fuel, if the little arrowhead is on the other side of the petrol pump, you'll know that the filler cap's on the right. 
on the left hand side it's on the left now I never knew that I do now and so do you now have some of those messages come as news to you this morning deathly silence <laughs> yes yes well that's what I mean about hidden messages and hidden things that I don't you don't see I've been in the Gospels in my personal devotions recently especially the Gospel of Mark and I've seen things there I've never ever seen before Kijun made reference to the disciples out on the Sea of Galilee and you'll remember that Jesus came walking to them on the sea and they actually traveled over to Gadara on the other side of the Sea of Galilee <clears throat> and you'll remember the story I'm not preaching about this this morning but I just want to illustrate how God shows you things you've never seen before I'd never appreciated that Jesus went over to Gadara for one reason and one reason only and that was to deliver a man who was possessed of the devil and to save him so that when Jesus had dealt with him he was found seated at his feet clothed and in his right mind and he wanted to follow Jesus wherever he could go with him and Jesus said no no you stay here and be a witness for me amongst your community because the community if you remember they'd come out because of the miracle that the Son of God had performed and the pigs that they lost and were drowned in the sea and basically said to Jesus <coughs> clear off we don't want you around well Jesus couldn't stay there but the Gadarene demoniac now who'd become a son of the living God could and they jumped in the boat and they went back over the lake to the other side I never knew that Jesus only went to the other side of the lake for the Gadarene demoniac how marvelous what value a man or a woman's soul well I want to talk to you this morning from Mark's Gospel chapter 9 I better have a look at my watch and see whether it's morning or afternoon um, I don't know whether you've got any meat in the oven or not um, but I can promise you we'll be home sometime today <laughs> how's that I won't keep you too long but we're looking in Mark's Gospel chapter 9 from verses 14 through to 29 and I'm reading from the New King James actually not the King James the New King James but I, I will be referring to the King James so let's read shall we and when Jesus came to the disciples he saw a great multitude around them and the scribes disputing with them immediately when they saw him all the people were greatly amazed and running to him greeted him and he asked the scribes what are you discussing with them then one of the crowd answered and said teacher I brought you my son who has a mute spirit and wherever it seizes him it throws him down he foams at the mouth gnashes with his teeth and becomes rigid so I spoke to your disciples that they should not cast that they should cast it out but they could not Jesus answered him and said O oh, faithless generation how long shall I be with you how long shall I bear with you bring him to me then they brought him to him and when he saw him immediately the spirit convulsed him and he fell on the ground and wallowed 
foaming at the mouth. So Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Now the King James and the New King James actually say that he cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. If you're reading the NIV, it doesn't have with tears in it. I believe it says, he exclaimed. Now to me, exclamation is something you do when you're excited. I think the tenor actually of his expression is with tears. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, this kind come out, can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Now again, there's a difference here between the King James and the NIV. The NIV says, can come out by nothing but prayer. It doesn't mention the fasting. We'll leave it there. Let's just pray for a moment, shall we? Father, we're so conscious of our need of Jesus. And Lord, I just come to you in his name, and pray that you'll take my words, Lord. As I was reminded this morning, I'm only a delivery boy, and I pray that you'll help me to deliver what I believe you've given me, Lord. And I pray for this congregation, and ask your blessing on them, Lord. I pray that you'll bless them with hearing ears, and more than that, Lord, I pray that you'll bless them with a responsive heart to hear your voice, and to choose to obey you and trust you, Lord. Oh, meet with us, we pray. We're such a needy people. We so need the presence of Jesus. Lord, hear us, for we ask it for his name's sake. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, I'll get my notes. Yeah, I've got just three points to make, actually, and that's all, just three points. Um, and they are these. The perplexing problem, the inspired inquiries, and the pitiful perceptive prayer. Just three points. The perplexing problem, the inspired inquiries, and the pitiful perceptive prayer.
In the context, this story, this episode in the life of Jesus happens just after his transfiguration up on the mountain. And you'll recall that at the start of our reading, it says, when the crowd saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder, I believe the NIV says. <clears throat> Other versions say they were greatly amazed. This is the Lord Jesus Christ who had come amongst them. He'd just come down from the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James and John. And something of the glory of God was still upon him. So that when they saw him, they knew who he was immediately. There was something about him which drew the folk to him. That's why the scripture says they were overwhelmed with wonder at this wonderful, wonderful man who had come amongst them. Here we have a man, the father of the son who had a dumb, dumb spirit, who was full of anxiety, calling out in prayer, seeking means of relief from the pressing, crushing problem that he'd got, but he didn't obtain it immediately. Now, I do believe this can be a picture of many of us in the church today. It may be that we've had something oppressing us or persisting with us and we've not seen relief and it's driven us into deeper grief and despair. But I do believe, you know, that looking at this story will give us great encouragement because the Lord Jesus came upon the scene and he made all the difference. Initially, his child was not healed. He was not cured. But he even seemed to be worse. How often in our own experience we can pray that God will come and do something and circumstances can seem to get worse and press in upon us even more. Well, be of good cheer. The matter has a happy end because the Lord Jesus displayed his healing power. So let's just look briefly, first of all, at the perplexing problem. Why wasn't his son healed initially? He brought him to the disciples and yet alone, they could do nothing. Had the Lord been present with them, they could have done everything. You know, I do believe this is a picture very often of the church today. I'm, to, I'm including myself. I'm not pointing the finger. But you know, those, those disciples were powerless because they were prayerless. And I want to ask you this morning, how's your personal prayer life with Jesus? How our prayer life is influences our relationship with him. But you know, the, the main difficulty 
that this man had was not with the disciples. It was partly with them, but it wasn't wholly with them. He probably thought that his son's case was pretty hopeless. Let's just look at it for a minute. His devil-inspired disease displayed, I've made a list of the things, dumbness, deafness, foaming at the mouth, fits, gnashing of teeth, Pining away, lifelessness, complete exhaustion, prostrations, suicidal tendencies, screaming, lunacy or insanity. Can you imagine living with that moment by moment and day by day? How pressed in would you feel but you know neither this case nor for any that we may plead is any difficulty to the God of the impossible and he's still the same hallelujah do you believe it Now this man in his converse with Jesus might have thought that the difficulty lay with the Lord Jesus. Listen to his words. If you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. If you can, now, a few hours previously, had this man been on the Mount of Transfiguration, he'd have known. He'd have known that the Lord could do something for his son. Have compassion on us. If he could have known Jesus' heart at that moment, he'd have seen his love poured out for him and for his young son. You know the difficulty of this case in Scripture and our case lies in our lack of faith. So the first point is the perplexing problem. The second one is the inspired inquiries. And we're going to focus on Jesus just for a minute. And I love to talk about him. He's so lovely. But you notice how he came and attention immediately of the crowd was focused on him because of his appearance and his demeanour. <clears throat> and he came upon the scribes and the disciples, the nine disciples who'd been left at the bottom of the mountain. And the scribes were arguing and questioning the disciples about why the son couldn't be healed. But notice Jesus' question. What are you disputing about? He goes right to the heart of the issue. And from amongst the crowd there comes a voice. The man <coughs> of the son who was possessed. And he says, Master, teacher, I've brought unto you my son which has a dumb spirit. And wherever... He takes him, he tears him, and he foams and gnashes with his teeth and pines away. 
and I spake to your disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. Notice some other inspired inquiries. Jesus makes a statement then, and he says, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him to me. You know, in those questions, Jesus was saying to the disciples and saying to the crowds, I'm not going away just now. Oh, faithless generation, I'm going to be around so that faith might be kindled in your heart. I'm glad that God has given us his spirit today. And he shall be with us, said Jesus, for how long? How long? 24 hours? A week? A month? Forever? What an assurance. What an assurance. Hallelujah. Here's another inspired inquiry. And he asked his father, Jesus said to him, how long is it since this came unto him? Now, Jesus always asks questions with a purpose. He never asked them just to pass the time away. They were always with a purpose because he wanted to uncover things and draw things out. Now this man knew that his son needed delivering. But what he didn't know up until the point of Jesus asking him that question was just how deep his need really was. And so Jesus asked him and said, how long is it since this came to him? And the man said of a child, in other words, it's been with him for years. And drawing this out of the man, it made the man realize there was a moment of revelation when he realized there was absolutely no hope, no help whatsoever outside of the Lord Jesus. He was utterly helpless and utterly hopeless unless Jesus stepped in. You'll remember, too, that the statement that was drawn out of this man's heart was this, and oftentimes it has cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. That's the devil's purpose, to, de to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Make no mistake. And this man recognized that this evil spirit that was upon his son, wanted to destroy him. But this is what the man says, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said unto him, notice how he turned the words around. The man said, if you can do anything to help us, have compassion on us. Jesus said in answer, if you can believe. All things are possible to him who believes. Now, we move from inspired inquiries to the pitiful perceptive prayer. Because this is exactly where Jesus wanted to bring this man. 
He was really uncovering the hidden need in the heart of this man. Now I said to you quite early on, I, 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 I'm seeing new things in Scripture which I'd never seen before. I'd never seen the need that this man really had. You remember the, we looked at those logos and we saw things that you'd not seen when you looked at them. <clears throat> well, you know, this is the purpose of God. We need someone to show us our hidden need. And there is one. And it's the Holy Spirit. He's the one who reveals our hidden need. Just as I revealed those hidden messages in those logos, so the Spirit comes and shows us our hidden need. And so you get, in response to the words of Jesus, the father of the child crying out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Do you know, he realized, didn't he, that the real problem was not Jesus helping his son if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. The real problem was his unbelief. Help my unbelief. Lord, that's the real issue. You've shown me you can do it. But oh... How I need you in my heart. That's what he was really saying. He wasn't exclaiming full of excitement. His heart was rent. In fact, if you look at the, the words in the original text, he was almost inarticulate. He could barely express himself because Christ had come so near and showed him the depth of his need, his real need. Now that's what Jesus wants to do with every single one of us. You know, unbelief, I've made a note of these things because it's, it's a sin that keeps us from the blessing of God. <clears throat> because personally, it robs us of trusting in the power of his omnipotence. It stops us from recognizing the value of the promise of God. It denies us seeing the efficacy of Christ's blood for us personally. It denies us too from perceiving and apprehending the prevalence of his plea. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And you know, he's never lost a case yet. He's standing there pleading for us at the right hand of the Father. Unbelief stops us from knowing the almightiness of the Spirit of God and experiencing Him in our lives day by day. And it robs us from seeing the truth of the Gospel. It's a poisonous thing, unbelief. 
So what's the solution? Well, there's only one. And it's the pitiful perceptive prayer. Oh Lord, I recognise my need. I see what you did for the father of the child with the dumb spirit. And oh God, I know what my need is. Lord, I believe that you're able to meet it. Help my unbelief. Come and meet me now, where I am, and touch me and draw me closer. Well, we know the wonderful answer. <clears throat> Help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, why? Because, you see, he'd taken them on one side. He wanted to deal with them personally. And he wants to do the same with each one of us. I'm glad that he doesn't deal with us corporately. There are, there are times when he does, but he deals with us individually, personally. And when he saw the crowd who discovered that Jesus had taken the man and his son on one side... They wanted a part of the action. <clears throat> but Jesus wanted to deal with the problem straight away. He rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, You dumb and deaf spirit, I charge you, come out of him and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was as one dead in so much that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand. <laughs> How lovely to know the touch of Jesus. What a difference his touch makes. Hallelujah. Just a chapter or two before, you'll remember, Jairus, the ruler in the synagogue, came to Jesus. And <clears throat> Jesus went with Jairus and was interrupted on the way by the woman who had the issue of blood. Never a problem to the Lord Jesus. He's always ready to deal with us individually, no matter what the cost. He's got time for you, and he's got time for me. He's never too busy to meet with us personally and touch us and meet our need. With Jairus... It looked as though things had gone too far because they met him on the way, didn't they? And said, don't trouble him anymore. Your daughter's dead. It's too late. But no, it isn't. Jesus went with Jairus. You'll remember the commotion that there was. They were all weeping and wailing. And Jesus said, out. All of you out. She's only sleeping. And they laughed him to scorn. And he put them all out. And went in. And took her by the hand and said, Talitha Kumai, little girl, I say unto you, arise. How lovely, the touch of Jesus. He's here this morning. And he's ready to touch you if you have. Need in your heart. He's promised. He's promised. Whatever your need is. It, it may have been a long time in your life, but you know, if you come and call upon his name, he'll touch you and lift you up. Praise him. That's his desire. In closing, let me tell you a little story. 
There was once a good woman who was well known among her circle for her simple faith and her great calmness in the midst of many trials. Another woman living at a distance hearing of her said, I must go and see that woman and learn the secret of her holy, happy life. She went and accosting the woman said, Are you the woman with the great faith? <coughs> no, she replied. I am not the woman with the great faith, but I am the woman with a little faith in a great God. Hallelujah. Well, we're closing now. But I just want to assure you from the scriptures we've read together and shared together this morning that he's able. He's able to meet your need, whatever it may be. All you've got to do is come and call, just as the man did with a son who was possessed by an evil spirit. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Something I've learned is that Jesus is attracted to weakness. There's something that draws him to our helplessness because he can come in with all his power and accomplish in us that we're t which we're totally, of inca totally incapable of doing ourselves. Don't look on your weakness as a failing. Look on it as driving you to Jesus because he can give you what you haven't got. That's why he came. So come and receive all that he's got for you. For his name's sake. Amen. Let's just pray for a moment. Father, we do want to thank you for your presence with us this morning. We do want to thank you for your word, Lord. It's so precious. And though my words are stumbling, I praise you, Lord, that your word is secure. And I pray that you will bless each one in this congregation as we've thought again about all that you can do in us, Lord. And I pray that you'll give us the grace to choose to come and call upon your name afresh that we might receive all that you have for us. For Jesus' sake. Amen. We're going to sing a hymn together <clears throat> and it's Pass Me Not, O Gentle Saviour. And if you want prayer, if you need prayer, let me encourage you to come out and receive it. Don't leave the service. Because I can guarantee your best intentions will evaporate very quickly. Do business with the Lord this morning. If you've felt your need, come and I can promise you he will meet it. Amen.